Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming along. The theme of this conference is shaping reality. So I thought I'd meet the challenge head on and begin with the question, what is reality? How do we define reality? Now, you can't ask yourselves that kind of question without being immediately reminded of a movie that's now 20 years old called The Matrix. Everybody remember it, hopefully? I know there are some youngsters in the audience that might not have got around to it yet. Well, it's very rare for a Hollywood movie to spark debates about philosophy, which is actually what The Matrix did. And there's a scene fairly early on in the movie where a character called Morpheus talks to a character called Neo and asks a simple series of questions. What is real? How do you define real? If you base it on what you can feel, touch, smell, and see, then reality is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. Now, I would have changed the script slightly. I would have said interpreted by your mind. But what the Matrix tells us, if you take it literally, and not just a piece of Hollywood fantasy, is a conclusion that philosophers reached already some centuries ago. And that is that we are prisoners of our minds. What we take to be reality is in fact entirely created from a summary of all of our experiences throughout our entire lives, right from infancy to listening to this talk today. And one of the things that we um, conclude from this is that your reality is therefore very personal. Um, and what I want to be able to do is to get you to imagine yourselves as infants. Uh, it's difficult to comprehend how you might create reality in your own minds, but think about your experiences as a small child. Um, where does your idea of reality come from? Well, it comes from all of the experiences you had as infants, everything that your parents told you. They told you that this is red. This is good for you. That is dangerous. So all of these things you pick up, you learn from your parents, you go to infant school, you interact, you make friendships, you make enemies, you learn language, you learn to have human empathy, which is your ability to socialize. To, to a certain extent, read how other people are thinking. Although you cannot ever read their minds. And the interesting thing is that what we talk about reality, although it's so entirely personal, there is a sense in which, of course, it's quite strongly shared. Society wouldn't function unless we had some kind of collective understanding of what we mean when we talk about reality. And uh, there's an American philosopher, his name is John Searle. Um, he wrote a book, you'll get the impression from this talk that I'm an avid reader. I like books and I'm going to share a few with you. Uh, he wrote a book on the construction of social reality. You know, what's different about social reality? Well, physical reality is that which we think of in terms of phys physical things in the world. Mountains, trees, streams, buildings. Social reality is a fascinating construction of human beings. Uh, if you think about all the institutions that we create, governments, please spare us, um, universities, places we come where we learn about how the world works or how we think it works. Uh, what John Searle observed was that we often take um, physical objects things that we find in the world outside, and we turn them into socially meaningful uh, representations. A good example is money. And I have to tell you that that 20 euro note in your purse or your wallet, um, the piece of paper with all of that nice colored ink is not worth 20 euros. The value of the piece of paper does not represent the value that's printed on the note. 
The value of a 20 euro note, of course, is represented by everything that uh, the European countries that have adopted the euro represent. It's backed up by state banks. Another example is a little piece of, in my case, white gold that we find in the natural world. We mine it, we turn it into a wedding ring. It's just a piece of metal. And yet, we, through our institutions that we create, give meaning to a simple piece of metal that I wear on my hand. And that gives me all kinds of obligations in terms of how I have to behave, because this tells you that I'm married. So we take these things and we create, we amalgamate them into a very, very complex system, a network of meanings that are entirely created by us. And if you stop to think about it, the fact that reality only exists individually in our minds, plus the fact that social reality is an entirely created reality coming from humans, I want to be able to convince you that that makes your reality extraordinarily vulnerable. But first, let me deal with the obvious question. How then does society work? If we each of us carry an individual version of reality in our own minds, how can we possibly get along? And it's really the result of all of those experiences from infancy. A bunch of shared experiences. The physical world exists independently of our ability to perceive it, we think. Philosophers would disagree. And that means that as a result of those shared experiences, we have common forms of knowledge, we have common forms of communication, we have um, common languages. As a result of all that commonality, we perceive these separate realities as one. But make no mistake, the reality that exists in here is unique to me. You don't have any access to my reality because, as far as I know, you can't read my mind. Likewise, you, each of you have a reality in your own mind. I don't have any access to that reality because I don't have access to your mind. Now, as a result of this creation, I want to try and convince you that that makes your reality vulnerable. So I'm going to try and persuade you uh, by reference to another book. This one, more recent. Thanks, Nina. Um, Steve Sloman is a cognitive scientist, and uh, as is Philip Fernbach, also a professor of marketing. Uh, marketers tend to be quite interested in how we process information for a reason that will become obvious very soon. And as a result of studies of how we acquire and process knowledge about the world, Sloman and Fernbach have come up with uh, an issue that they call the illusion of explanatory depth. The simple fact of the matter is that the societies we've created are so complex that no single human mind can fathom it all. You can't. So we rely on what they call a community of knowledge. Basically, um, we trust that someone, somewhere, knows how this works. But the problem with the illusion of explanatory depth is that we think we know more than we really do. So take, for example, well, we're in a technical university, right? So we're all technical experts. Yes? We all know how GPS works. Yep, you know when you use Google Maps, you're accessing a system, a network of 24 or more satellites orbiting the Earth at 20,000 kilometers. Now, at any one particular point on the surface of the Earth, at any one particular moment in time, you're accessing between six to ten of these satellites. They allow you to triangulate your position. Now, each of these satellites has on board a miniaturized atomic clock. And the satellites send position, time and position data, to your device, your smartphone, on which you're looking to see the fastest way to get to the bar or the theater. 
And so you're technically educated, you think you've understood how this works. But then there's the illusion of explanatory depth. I wonder how many of you knew that without corrections introduced by Einstein's special and general theories of relativity, those satellites would accumulate timing errors leading to position errors of up to 11 kilometers per day. And I would respectfully suggest if you're in a hurry to get to the bar, having a circle 11 kilometers in radius is not helpful. So this is the illusion of explanatory depth. We're more ignorant than we think we are. We think we know how the world works, but we don't not in the detail. We rely on a community of knowledge where we assume somebody knows how that works. So we think we know how GPS works just because we know how to use the app, as I've used several times in getting to this venue. Now that's only the beginning of our problems. Remember, social reality in particular is a human invention. We create the institutions, we create all of the things that we take for granted as being part of a society. When we start to look at how our mind processes information and acquires knowledge, we run the risk of thinking we know more than we really do. But then what about forming beliefs and making decisions on those beliefs? Here's another book that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, Daniel Kahneman is a Nobel Prize winning behavioral economist. Behavioral economists are really interested in how we process information, come to beliefs, and make decisions. And he wrote a best-selling book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Now, um, Kahneman, as have other cognitive scientists, have identified that effectively there's two sides to the way we process information. There's system one, which is intuitive. It's more emotional. It's biased towards believing. It's our mechanism for jumping to conclusions. This is what Kahneman calls thinking fast. It's spontaneous. I tend to think of it as our inner Kirk, for those of you who are familiar with that period in Star Trek's history. Then there's system two. More rational, more logical, more scientific, biased towards doubting or unbelieving which Kahneman calls thinking slow. You know where I'm going with this. This is our inner Spock. Here's how it works. So here's a problem which I'm sure technically educated people will get instantly. A bat and ball together cost one euro ten. But we know that the bat costs precisely one euro more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Who said ten cents? That's your system one. That's thinking fast you jump to an intuitive conclusion. Um, the logical conclusion, Spock would say, that's illogical, Captain. Uh, the right answer is five cents. Okay, so taken together, we are potentially victims of our own ignorance. We think we know more than we do. And potentially, we think with our hearts, system one, inner Kirk, more than we do with our heads, our rational selves. Now, this not only exposes us to the wiles of advertising agencies and marketing people who, by the way, want to appeal to our emotions. That's the way they avoid having us come to a rational conclusion about what to buy. But there's a form of more insidious manipulation that we're potentially vulnerable to, which is called propaganda. Now, propaganda actually dates back to the Roman Catholic Church many, many centuries ago, but it really came to the fore with a book by this guy called Edward Bernays. He's actually a nephew of Sigmund Freud and a great uncle of Mark Randolph, who's the Netflix um, co-founder. Now, um, this is what Bernays had to say. He said that those who manipulate this unseen mechanism through misinformation and propaganda constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. Now, this invisible government, Benes himself, I'm sure, felt that it was a rather benign government, a force for good in the world or in a country. 
But there was nothing benign about Benet's campaign for a company called the United Fruit Company, who in 1954 um, was uh, involved in a campaign to persuade the US administration to support a CIA-led coup against the elected government of Guatemala, the government of Jacobo Arbenz. Why? Well, because the United Fruit Company wasn't going to benefit from land reforms that the government had proposed, and by deposing the elected uh, leader of the country, uh, United Fruit were able to avoid those reforms, uh, maintain access to cheap labor, and preserve the profit margins on bananas and pineapples. So let's be aware that there's an insidious side to this vulnerability. Now you might think, well, okay, that's 1954, Jim. Uh, the world's moved on. We're not quite so easily manipulated by misinformation and propaganda today. But I'd like to draw your attention to a recent referendum in my country. Now I voted Remain. Ich bin ein Berliner. Um, but there was shock and horror at the result of the referendum in June 2016. And what I want to do is yeah. to share with you this video. But when I was a teenager, the coal mines and the steelworks closed, and the entire area was devastated. And I went there because it had one of the highest leave votes in the country. 62% of the people here voted to leave the European Union, and I wanted to know why. When I got there, I was just a bit taken aback, because the last time I went to Ebervale, it looked like this. And now it looks like this. This is a new £33 million College of Further Education that was mostly funded by the European Union. And this is the new sports centre, that's at the middle of a £350 million regeneration project that's being funded by the European Union. And this is the new £77 million road improvement scheme, and there's a new train line, a new railway station, they're all being funded by the European Union. And it's not as if any of this is a secret, because there's big signs like this <laughs> everywhere. So that's Carol Cadwallader, who gave a TED talk on this in Vancouver just last month. And I know I've cheated. I'm giving a TED talk, and I've shown you a video of someone else giving a TED talk. <laughs> but hey, um, I, I thought it was very, very telling. Uh, she's an observer journalist, uh, and she was just really curious uh, as to why this vote had gone the way it had. And what she discovered uh, through talking to people in this mining, former mining uh, town of Ebervale. Uh, was that uh, people uh, felt that the EU had done nothing for them, despite what is so very visible in the town itself. And that, and that there was a problem with immigration. And there are virtually no immigrants in Ebervale. And what she discovered, in fact, was that the Vote Leave campaign had used the services of a company called Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica had illegally acquired 87 million Facebook profiles. And they'd used those profiles for a micro-targeting campaign. That's Facebook's business model, by the way. There's nothing unusual about that. Um, based on ads such as this. Now, this is perfectly innocent. You would click on this, wouldn't you? Who wouldn't want to win 50 million? Mind you, the probability of winning anything. Uh, was negligible in this case. But those people responding to this ad, and if they fit the right profile, were then given ads like this, which peddles misinformation and propaganda, which is fake news about the cost of EU membership to the UK. And then information like this. Now, at the time, it was a nonsense that Turkey was about to join the EU, but look how simple that message is. The Remain campaign had bombarded the British public with facts and figures about the economic cost of leaving the EU. They had appealed to the public's inner Spock, the rational, fact-based, deliberative mode of decision-making. Vote Leave went straight for the inner Kirk. 
They wanted to make people afraid and blame the EU for most of what they felt were genuine grievances. So misinformation and propaganda is with us very much still today. We're dealing with the consequences, the fallout from that referendum. We might not leave. I certainly hope we can have a second referendum which will overturn the vote. But there's already an economic cost to British citizens of being misled by appeals to their, in effect, their unwillingness to come to terms with their own ignorance. One conservative MP minister actually was surprised to learn how important Dover was as a port. If that's not the illusion of explanatory depth, I really don't know what is. And we don't know how vulnerable we are to manipulation based on um, our system one, our inner Kirk. So these manipulations threaten to change our personal reality. Um, we go through life building this reality in our minds, it's very precious. It makes you who you are. It makes you unique, uh, apart from anything else. And what we have to do, not only as a society, but also um, globally, is we have to come to terms to, uh, with the fact that we need to protect this reality. And the way to protect it is just to acknowledge um, this is a quote attributed to Bertrand Russell. I'm not sure he actually ever said it. But the whole problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves and wiser people so full of doubts. The way to protect your personal reality is to be absolutely clear and become aware of your vulnerability and then learn to be doubtful. Don't believe everything you see. Of course, you're fortunate you might be going through a technical education which gives you the critical thinking skills which will allow you to, be re to realize when you're being misled. Not everyone is quite so fortunate. And we have to learn how we can help people to come to terms and embrace their inner Spock to become wiser. Thank you very much.